five after 11, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to be speaking today on the census takers tracks and uh, 10 year snapshots for family historians. And um, lots of information is in those censuses, just waiting for you to discover it. Um, and I will tell you that I'm not speaking, I'm not going to tell you what's in the, night, the eight, 1950 census, which is going to come out end of this month, when April 1st, my birthday, all right. What a birthday present, I get to, I'm not quite on there, I'm almost on there, but not quite. So anyway, well, but that, I'm not going to be speaking on that, I'm gonna be speaking on the historical censuses that we have that we can all use for our, we find information about our ancestors. So, contrary to popular belief, the census was not undertaken by the United States just so we could figure out where great-great-grandpa lived in 1840. It was mandated by Article I, Section 2 of the Constitution in 1787, and George Washington signed it into law in March 1790, and the U.S. became the first country to implement a comprehensive and regular count of its population. Now, many genealogists already know uh, some facts about the census, but I'm gonna take each one, one by one, starting with the first one in 1790, and just give you a few highlights that uh, you might be interested in. So the first one was uh, 1790. Wait a minute, I'm, okay. There we go. Here we go, now we're up to date. All right, the first one was in 1790, and the last one open to the, to the public is 1940, but very soon we will have 1950. And so let's just talk about some of the things that are on the, each census. I'm just gonna give just a little bit. I'm not gonna go in detail, depth, and spend a lot of time on each one. But um, the 1790 to 1840 censuses only list the name of the head of household with tick marks for the age and sex of the members of that household. So if you have, they divided it into certain um, certain ages and they'll have a tick mark for every person of that sex and that age on there. The 1850 census is the first to list all members of the household but it does not list their relationship to each other. So you don't know exactly how they're related. But 1880 is the first one that lists relationship to the head of household. So it will have father, mother, but it's always relationship to the head of household. Uh, and uh, so you want to be sure that you, when you look and it says mother-in-law, you, you, you want to say it's the mother-in-law of the head of household, not the mother-in-law of the wife. It's the mother-in-law of the head of the household. So um, census schedules, I just want to, there are several different kinds of census schedules. There's a population schedule, which is the one I'm going to be talking about today. There's an agriculture schedule industry and manufacturing schedules, mortality schedules, and the defective, dependent, and delinquent schedules. Now, John likes that one, my husband. He likes that one because he knows my ancestors are on there somewhere. He's been looking for a long time, and we did find one, um, one of my great, great uncles who was dumb and idiotic. But at that, now at that time, dumb and idiotic didn't mean the same thing it means today. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure that you know that. But anyway, but these are different census schedules. They list different things. They tell you more things about your family. If you see that your family, your ancestor was a farmer, you might want to look into the agriculture schedule and see the kinds of things that he, uh, that he grew and that sort of thing. So, and I have a few objectives for my presentation today. I want to tell you something you don't already know. Um, I want to share some research tips for using the census, and I wanted to examine some facts on various censuses. And then I have some case studies it, um, illustrating certain caveats when using the census. And um, I want to I'll go to the next one. I want to leave you with an appreciation for the census enumerators. And part of your handout is one, uh, has a letter there written by one of the men who did a census, was a census enumerator. And he had a great 
uh, he had a great story to tell. But just think about if you had the job of going to, you know, 500 people or however how many people you were assigned uh, to go and ask them all of these questions that were on the census. Sometimes they did, they figured, especially in the uh, in the south and in the mountains, uh, Appalachian, things like that, they figured it was none of your business how many children they had or how old they were and those sorts of things. So they had a, real, they had a really uh, difficult job sometimes. Okay, let's talk about the 1790, 1800, and 1810 censuses do not survive for these states, Georgia, Delaware, Kentucky, New Jersey, and Virginia. And that was thanks to the War of 1812. They were destroyed during the War of 1812. So we have to find, we have to be creative uh, in those states and finding some, uh, finding some documentation to tell us things that uh, come prior to that because we don't have census records until 1820 for these states. And Newman, I wanted to say, those of you who may be interested in uh, in African American research, uh, uh, there's a list of free black heads of families in the first census that has been published, and I believe the girl's name, it, the lady, the author's name, her last name is Newman, but uh, it is online. You can look it up at FamilySearch.org. Has it on their uh, on their website. You can click on books, look for books, and find you can find that there. Um, and that's that can be helpful when you're doing uh, African American research. And I think about um, census transcription sheets. You know, often we look we'll look at the we'll look at a census and we'll say, now what is this telling me? And you might try to figure out a little bit, but if you take this, there are census transcription sheets available online, and if you take that census transcription sheet and look at that census in detail, you may find uh, some information that you would not have noticed otherwise. And I always, uh, I always encourage people starting out on their research to, to take these, get these census transcription sheets and fill them out for your families because you may find something that you would not, you might have overlooked if you didn't use them. And here's, that was a 1790. Now you see how much more information is on the 1920. They ask a lot more things. And, uh, and you want to know all of these things out here uh, in, the, in the, all of these columns that they ask you about their education, their citizenship, um, and different things about them that, um, that are important that you might lead you to other, uh, other information to say, well, that citizenship, they became a citizen in a certain year. Well, you say, oh, well, maybe I can go and look for their citizenship records and find out more information about them that they filled out when they came here. They came here 1870s, 80s, something like that. Uh, so I always encourage folks to use the census transcription sheets. Let me see. Now here is the seven. I'm going to show you some, give you some, uh, some. I'm going to go through and show you some examples of a census and what they what they kind of look like. This one is the 1790 census, and of course the thing that makes it new, 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 new unique. Why don't I put the N instead of the U? Unique. The thing that makes it different is that it was the first one, of course. It was taken the 2nd of August, 1790. Each time they had a census, Congress declared what date it was to be effective as of. In other words, the uh, censuses now usually are April 1st or June 1st. But you need to know that if you say, well, they're, they're, say they're 50 years old. Well, if the census was taken it, it, it makes a difference if it was taken in June or if it was take, the census was actually taken, physically taken in August or October. These things are on, your, on the censuses and it will tell you that. And this of course lists only the households by name and it just has, um, it has columns for the ages that they're looking at. And then um, the males are divided of the, uh, on, on 1790, you only know if they're over 16 or under 16. That's all you know. It's the males are over 16 or under 16. And uh, other free persons and slaves are also listed on this census. 
And uh, this one is the household of uh, Francis Peterson. Just doing a little research on him, trying to find some things. Here's the 800 census. Uh, it's useful in further defining the ages of the families. If you can track your family, um, 1790, 1800, 1810, 1820, you can, it, this, the, um, the age brackets get smaller. So it gives you a better target for figuring out exactly how old some of the people in there were. But it only lists the head of the household. Okay, here's the 1820. You can see there are a lot more columns. Um, and the governor, government in 1820 decided they would complicate things a little bit by overlapping some of the age categories. So um, there's an age category of between 16 to 18, and then there's an age category of 16 to 26. So if your ancestor was 16, 17, or 18, he could be listed in either one of those columns. So you need to take that into consideration when you're trying to figure that out. Um, it also has a column in the 1820 census regarding the naturalization. The number of foreigners not naturalized is listed, so there may be someone that, that may tell you you need to go look for something else in that area. Um, Yes, this is the head of household on the on the left. On the left, right. No, the left. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, it's on the left. That's the head of household. And uh, these are on Ancestry and other 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 uh, websites. And you can make them when you're looking at your computer. You can make them bigger so that you can read them a little better. But um, and you have to remember sometimes that. Uh, you might want to look at something um, yourself because when they were uh, indexing these and putting them online, often they're, they're not very readable. I think that every people who take the census and people who work in courthouses should have to have good penmanship, but they don't. So sometimes you have to uh, make sure that you're looking at the right person and that, uh, that it's, um, it's the where you can re and the things and you know you and the thing about the, all of these columns is you can get them mixed up and up at the top of the census the original they don't put 18 to 25 they don't put the age brackets so you need those uh, census transcription sheets to pull that information off where the way you would like to see it um, they're on ancestry or you there they probably have them on uh, you can just say Census transcript, yeah, they, they have them online. And you print them out. I just keep a stack of them and print them out. And then you can uh, ma you make sure you get all the information about your ancestor, not just when they were born and when they died, because you can see that um, more easily. Uh, but you can see when they were born, because a lot of them have their age on it. Uh, the 1790 to 1820 censuses, I, this, I found this interesting, were posted for correction by the cens citizens Places of posting those included things like courthouses, the church, or even saloons. Wherever it was that people gathered, they put those out so that they could be uh, reviewed and corrected. So a fellow could come into town and have a few beers with his neighbors and check his census and make sure that all the tick marks for all of his children were in the right column, and uh, they could correct them. But of course, Anybody could do that uh, because they didn't, they didn't monitor who was, who was looking at the census. But I thought it was interesting that they did post them and allow folks to uh, come and check them before they sent them where they needed to be. Um, in 1830, uh, that was the first time that the enumerator was provided with uniform printed forms. Before that, they just had their columns that they knew they were supposed to do, and they'd go out and do it. They'd come back, and they would either, they had to make some copies to send, so they would take what they had, to, had gotten that day, and they would copy it onto another sheet. So there's an opportunity for them to get in the wrong column, and if they just gave it to their wife and said, would you mind doing this? I've got to go take a bath, because uh, I've been out in the, in, the, out in, the, in the country all day, you know, moving, opening fences and trying to get through and all that. So it, you don't know, we don't know 
uh, the things that we don't know about census is one, you do not know who gave the information to the census taker. It could have been the wife, it could have been the head of household, it could have been a daughter, a son, anybody that was there. Often they had, in the, especially in the country, they had to travel long distances. And if they got out there and nobody was at home next door, they might have been asked the neighbors, well, who lives next door? Because I don't want to come all the way out here 20 miles on my horse tomorrow to see. And so you never know, you do not know, just keep that in mind, you do not know who gave the information that is on the census. So just keep that in mind as you're working with them. Uh, but in 1730, they gave them uniform printed forms. And the category of over 100 years of age was added in 1830. So let's look at 1840. It has a significant bonus on it. Uh, Revolutionary War pensioners and their widows were named along with the exact age of the person. So that's a big help if you're looking for Rev War um, soldiers uh, or pensioners and their widows. They are named specifically even if they weren't the head of household. Often it would have been their son or someone else who was the head of household, they might have just been living with them. So, 1840 is, um, has that bonus for us. Uh, for the first time, it asks things like uh, the number of people who are engaged in mining or agriculture or commerce or manufacturing, if they were, nav they were involved in navigation of the oceans, navigation of canals, lakes, or rivers, and um, if they were learning professionals and engineers. So they, had diff they asked different things, and you can find out things about what your ancestor might have done for a living that will be uh, valuable to you later. But really, uh, really, I enjoyed having the name and the exact name and exact age of uh, uh, pensioners from the Revolutionary War in 1840. That was a long time after the Revolution. So most of them were in their 80s and 90s things like that. 1850 census, now this is the first to list everybody in the household by name and place of birth. The occupations were listed and um, we're following a fellow named Peter Peterson. All of these are Peter Peterson and here he's 50, he's uh, in 1850, he's 63 years old so it gives you an exact date of his uh, year of his birth about because he could have been born early in that year later in that year, and it depends on the date that they actually took the census. So, uh, so I want to keep that in mind. So Peter is 63 here, and in 1860, he's 73, he's perfect. That doesn't happen very often. Sometimes they either didn't know or their birthday was before or after the date the census was taken, those sorts of things. So we always say about, and you'll see on Ancestry when they have abstract, no, abstracted those for you. They'll say, uh, on a 1850 census, they'll say he was born about a certain year, instead of giving an exact, saying he was born in that year. Um, so he's still living, and he's in the household of a Franklin McRae, and we think that's probably his son-in-law. So you can tell by the people that are in the, in the census with him that uh, possibly that's who that is. And there's also, um, in these censuses, when you see the head of household and there's a, a man and a woman, say 35 and 32, and at the bottom, and then there's some children listed, and then at the bottom there's um, someone listed, a female, who is old enough to be their parents or their mother listed, might be 50 or 60 years old, uh, she will be listed, and if she, do, if she is the wife's uh, mother, she'll have a different surname. So often, if you sign, find in the 18, uh, some of these 1850, 1860, 1870 censuses, if you see someone in that, usually they do the husband, the wife, the children, and then they do the people who are not in that category. And you, sometimes they will have the, um, the a lot of times, the uh, mothers of the wives in the household will be listed at the bottom. So that's a clue that that, that surname that she carries might be the surname of the wife, if you don't know that already. Okay, let's go to 1870. 
the 1870 census called for dwelling houses to be numbered by order of visitation, and also families were ordered uh, in, the number of the, in the number in which the, they were enumerated. Um, this is a very disruptive time in U.S. history, specifically, especially for the uh, conf former Confederate states, and often large numbers of people may not have made it on the census. They might, there have been various and sundry many reasons why they might not be there. So sometimes 1870 will not exactly match or 1850 and 1860 because of the disruption that was uh, after the, uh, the war. Um, 1880 is, is our, our favorites because it is the first time that the relationship to the head of household for each person in the household is given. And it's the first um, time in, um, when you're doing urban neighborhoods, it's the first time the street and house number would be listed for those uh, people who are in cities. So, and the birthplace of the mother and father of the person who is enumerated is given. So you've got the husband and he lists his information but then it also has two columns over here on the right-hand side of that page that tells you where his mother was born, the state, and where his father was born, which gives you information about where to go look for next time if they came from North Carolina or some other place. You know that they were, if they were born there, that's where you need to go to do your, to do your research. Um, let's see. And that's... And the race classification of Indian was first used on this particular uh, census, the 1880 census. Okay, all right. Now, I'm going to talk about, hmm, my, fly, my slides are not in the order of my script here. Okay, so most of the 1890 census was destroyed in a fire in the basement of the Commerce Department in 1921, and less than 1% survives, and only about 6,000 individuals and only fragments of certain, certain uh, areas survive. Uh, this break in that 10-year interval is, uh, causes a lot of consternation for genealogists because you got the 1880, and you don't see them again until 1900. So that's 20 years that we don't have that intervening 10-year uh, census. It's especially, um, I said, it causes consternation for genealogists. That's a nice way of saying it, it's aggravating. But um, when you're looking for parents of ancestors born after 1880, especially female ancestors, and uh, you, it's just so aggravating that uh, if female ancestors were born after the 1880 census, they don't appear in their father's household. And if they get married before 1900, they don't appear in their father's household. So you lose, you know, it's, it's very, this, I think that they should have made a law that you couldn't, just couldn't marry until after the 1900 census. Because so many times you're looking for her in her father's household to get her maiden name. And if she's born after 1881, after 1880 census was taken, and before 1900, then you don't, you don't find that. And uh, sometimes they marry and you find them with, the, uh, with their married name because you happen to know what it is. But it can be very, up, uh, very hard to, to track their maiden name and find out who the, on the census who their parents might have been. So, I'm not sure why this is. Uh-oh. Well, carbonite. Let me see if I can get rid of this. Clear. Close. Okay. <laughs> ah, well, I did something. Okay. Let me see what's happened here. Okay. There we are. Now we're in the right place. Okay, here's the 1900 census. Now the 1900 census, and you see how much more information you're getting here, is the only census to report the year and month of birth 
of the person who's enumerated. So a lot of times, uh, if you're looking for the birth date of someone in this era, this is the only census, the actual census, that gives it to you. Uh, it will list them as uh, like March 1830, October 1882, those kinds of things. It gives you a date of birth for the people who are enumerated on the census. Um, let's see. And on this census that I've got up here, Celia Snowden, um, one of my ancestors, I think, was the head of household. And she was born in 1830, and she was widowed. So that tells you that her husband was deceased by this time. And in her household are grandchildren. So this is also the first census to note the number of children born to a female ancestor and the number of children still living. So it shows you if they had seven children and three are still living, those kinds of things you find out about your family using that, uh, this census. We all love the, the 1880 we really love because it gives the relationship. 1900 is my next favorite because it gives me a, a month and a year of birth. And it tells you things about the family, like how many children this woman has had, how many of those are still living. No, it doesn't list them by name. It just tells you how many are living. So but on, the, on the line where the mother is, it'll have, it has columns that say number of children born and number of children still living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Where is Celia? No, I think it says one. Okay. Oh yes, that's uh, Sarah Johnson. See, this is another fam. There's another family. There's a Snowden family at the top, and then Johnson is next. So the 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 one you're looking at is Sarah Johnson, and she has had seven children, and five are still living. Okay. They don't list the children's names. Well, if they're still living and they're still in the family, they would be listed under there. Yes. Yes, if they're still in the household. They might be married. You know, they may have already grown up and been married and they're not in the household. So you don't get the names of all the children. But if they're still in the household, you get their names. But those that are deceased, you just get a number of those um, you know, she had seven, five are still living. And if you have five listed in that household, then you can, you know, that's, um, that's you've got the names of those children. Okay, let's look at 1910. Uh, the census, this census notes the year of immigration. So if you have somebody who came a little bit later um, in the, like the 1880s and things like that, I think my husband's folks came in the 1880s from, um, from Ireland, and uh, so that gives you an exact date that they, in the year that they immigrated, which can lead you, gives you clues to go look for some immigration records. Uh, so you can go look for those and get more information about your ancestors. Um, let's see, the war between the states, veterans were identified. Um, this is my, John B. Dubois is my great grandfather's family. He had eight children born and four living. Now this confirms information that I found in the family Bible for this. So it can confirm things that you already know when you're looking at the census. Um, and number of years in present marriage. That's important because often, uh, you know, people uh, died. They had they were married twice or whatever. And you want to be sure that you're looking at the right uh, mother for the children because the relationship of child or son or daughter is to the head of household. They are the children of the head of the household, which is usually a male. It may be a male if it is a male. Then you need to, you know, you need to be careful that you don't assign them to that wife um, if if you don't know for certain that she was his first wife and that sort of thing. And they're also on here. They tell you things about how long how long they've been married and it might tell you age at first marriage so you can kind of do some figuring on these things uh, so you have to that's why I say look at every get those get those sheets and transcribe those
Um, and it gives us a date of marriage of this particular couple. So if they married in, let's see, this is in 1910, if, they, if they've been married 10 years and there are children listed that are the head of household's children and they're 15 years old, then they had a different mother because these people have only been married 10 years. Now, it's possible that they could have had some before they married. But, you know, that's usually, you can make those inferences and go and look for uh, more information. And here's the 1920. 1920 census asked for the year of naturalization. When people came from, over, from other places, they could be naturalized. And it's not just the year that they immigrated, which was on the 1910, but on the 1920, if they were naturalized, it gives you the exact year for you to go and look for, um, look for their naturalization records with a smaller time frame to look for, because you know the exact year that they were uh, that they were naturalized. Um, Let's see. This is the ins this is the census of Georgiana Watson, the head of she's the head of household, and her husband James and son Malcolm. Now I don't know why she's listed as the head of household, but perhaps uh, she wore the pants in the family. I don't know, but anyway, she is listed as the head of household, and um, the naturalization date of 1907 tells you that um, it's a federal record because prior to 1906 naturalizations could take place in any level court did not have to be in the uh, federal it was not a federal record so um, so you need you need to know a little history you have to you're always learning something new uh, when it comes to genealogies and you need to know everything you can about naturalization where would it have been filed in this at this particular date and time so um, so uh, 1907 was the beginning of federal naturalization records, which can make them a lot easier to find because if you're looking for local, in any level court, it's just, could be a hot, you know, you, you just don't know where to look if it could be done in any court, in any place, um, in any state, that sort of thing. It also tells you if their mother tongue is English or if they perhaps came from another place. It'll say, it may say German or Italian or something like that. So it helps you to know where they came from if they're uh, later uh, people who are coming in. Okay. Yes. Right here. That is your, uh, that's the relate, that's your status. Like if you're the head of household, son, husband, that sort of thing. I thought it was unusual. The woman is listed as the head of household. Then underneath there is husband. It's, it's, uh, no, that just tells you their, stat their relationship to the head of household. That's what it is. She's the head of household, so they put head for the person that's in charge of the household. Then underneath there, the first man, James, is listed as husband. He's the husband of the head of household. The next one over. Oh, well that, I can't, I'm not sure what that column is. Uh, you get that transcription sheet and you'll know. <laughs> You know exactly. I think it could be if mar sometimes it is whether or not they're married um, or whether or not they just have, it has different, different depending on the census is what uh, tells you that. But usually it's the relationship, rela let's see. Some, usually it has to do with marriage. It's possible now farther out. This is just one little piece. There are lots of other, lots of other um, columns that ask different things, and they will ask things like that sometimes. It just depends on the census as to what they ask that census, because uh, they do have one that's uh, that lists if they were uh, disabled and things like that. So, it, that, and you have to just get that. Darn it, it's doing it again. Carbonite, I do not want you. How did I do it last time? 
Well, that's another thing. If you don't have carbonite, you need to get it or something like it. Does anybody, anybody know what carbonite is? Carbonite is a service, and it's like maybe $60 a year or so, and it gives you the ability to recover any lost files. It automatically saves files continuously, and if you say, if you've worked on something for like three hours, and all of a sudden it just disappears, you hit the delete button and it disappears, carbonite has saved that and you can go into carp your carbonite and you can call it up and it's there for you and if you are looking for something that you might have deleted or if you have a, a power outage or your computer just blows up or whatever but carbonite is really I, I would they would have to put me six feet under if I lost the stuff on my computer so uh, so I have a great deal I use carbonite and there are some others. There are iDrive, iCloud, all of those kinds of things. Make sure your computer is backed up somewhere else on a, on, and not, and the thing, you know, so a lot of people do it on another drive that's sitting next to their computer. But if their house has a fire or a flood or something, and what happens if, you're, if you're, where you've got it backed up is gone too? So carbonite, iDrive, things like that. Be sure and get those, um, and they're really inex you know, they're, to me, they're inexpensive for the amount of peace of mind that it gives you. So as I said, they'd have to put me six feet under. I would just, mm, it wouldn't be it. Okay, now, let's look at 1930. I think this is an interesting, I don't watch my time, I'll be okay. 19, let's see, where am I? <laughs> It's not working. Okay. Okay. Well, it's decided it's not going to work. Yeah. Hmm. Well, until he decide until he decides to unlock. Um. I will tell you that the 1930 asked certain things. If there were a veteran and a so of what war, it asked things like age at first marriage. We can tell you if that couple you're looking at has been married to someone else before. Um, or, and it also helps you to know if the, uh, the wife is old enough to have had children uh, that are 18 years old or something like that. So you can tell, uh, that'll give you clues as to what um, whether or not she is the mother of those children because you know the census only gives you the relationship to the head of household not to the wife of the head of household so you need to be careful about that and this one they ask you whether or not you owned a radio set and um, you know and the reason they did that and so some people would say you know especially you come in and ask somebody if they own a radio set, you wonder, why are they asking me? Are they going to come? This, this is the government. They're here to help me, right? And uh, so they, they're asking you if you own a radio. Now, they are, gonna, are they going to take my radio? What are they going to do with it? So sometimes you would, might not give them the right answer. But the reason they were doing that is because the radios were just coming into uh, where they, a lot of people had them, and they needed to know where to put their radio towers. So they wanted to know where the most people had their radio, you know, most people lived that had radios, so they would know where to put their radio towers. Perfectly innocent, you know, information that they wanted, you know, for that particular census. So, um, so that, you know, they, they asked different, as I said, different questions on different, and it's amazing what you can learn about your ancestors if you get those census transcription sheets and look at the questions that they ask and how your ancestors answered those questions. That's what I really uh, wanted to impress upon you. Okay, now I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be mad if I don't get my, let's see, it's hung, it's, hmm. see if you can unhook me. Okay, I'll let him do it and then. It, is, it, is it not moving forward for you? Yeah. Magic fingers. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, so you hang around because I'll probably mess it up. Okay, so this is the 1930 we just talked about. This is what I wanted to help you show you, and, and you know, um, you have different birth and date, right, different birth ages on this census, each census. And um, so I took this particular individual who was born, I'm gonna try to figure out when he was born. The first time I see him is in 1790, and he is, um, he is uh, less than 16 years old, which tells me he was born after 1774. Do you see what I did? It's the 1790 census, he's less than 16, I subtract 16, that tells me he was born after 1774. In 1800, he appears in the 10 to 16 age bracket. So then you've got to subtract 16, and you've got to subtract 10, and that tells you he was born 1784 to 1790. With me so far? In 1810, see they changed age brackets on all these censuses. In 1810, he was in the 16 to 26 age bracket, which says he was born 1784 to 1794. And in 1820, he was in the 26 to 45, which tells us he was born 1775 to 1794. In 1830, he's 40 to 50. I don't use the nines, I just round it off to the 40 to 50, and that tells me he was born 1780 to 1790. And in 1840, he's 50 to 60, so he's, he's doing, you know, he's progressing. 1790 to 1780 to 1790. And then I, I take all of those and I take the column for the earliest date, and I pick the latest earliest date and for the column for the, um, the later date, I picked the latest one. So, you, and you, when you do this yourself, you'll figure out why I did do it that way. So he, in all of these, he had to be born after, the latest after I've got is 1784. And then over here, I think, I, I think I've done this incorrectly. Uh, this should be 1794, so it should be 1780 to 1790, no, 1794. Oh, that is, right, 1784 to 1794. Because you see, I've got two 1794s up here. Okay, so, um, so on the 1850 census, I have his exact age, supposedly, of 63, which means he was born in 1787. And in 1860, he's 73. He aged 10 years. That was glad to see that. Makes him 1787. So you see, you can use the earlier censuses to get, he has to be born before this date, after this date, and before this date. And then you see, we came up with 1784 to 17, should be 1794. And, but he was actually born 1787 when he comes off onto the 1850 census. So you can use them, even if he didn't live to the 1780 census, you could get a, a ballpark of when he was actually born using these censuses, the early census records. I know that's hard to follow with, uh, without having a pencil and paper and having it right in front of you. But it is something that if, you, if he didn't make it to the 1850 census and you're trying to figure out when they were born, I often do this, I make me a little, make me a little chart find them on every, those 1790 to 1840 censuses, and put their age brackets, get those eight dates of birth and dates of death, and then choose, you know, choose the latest date of birth and the earliest date of death, and then you've got the corridor where he, where he would, his, um, his age would be. I've done that a lot of times when you just can't figure it out, and you need to know how old they were. Okay, let me see. Let me, I want to um, talk about some things that are on the census that you might not uh, notice. This is the 1800 census, and the census taker on this one, this is uh, Edward Gardner, is on this census, and it says his, his son of Jesse, so he's on here, and it has a little note that says son of Jesse, so there must have been more than one 
uh, Edward Gardner on the on the in that area. So he gives you that uh, the, gives you that information. Yes. Up. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. I give up. Let's see. All right. Let's go to 1830. I was trying to find you, give you some examples of things that are on the censuses that you might not, in, be, might not know about. So 1830, this tells us uh, James, da there's a James Davis on here, and it tells him, um, let's see, it tells you where he was. Oh, there, there's, ja this is not, okay, James, this is 1830 census of Ware County. This is telling you the difference. There's two James Joneses in this county. One is James Jones Slim, and one is James Jones Little. So you've got, you, now you know there are two James Joneses in this county, and you have, need to figure out if your ancestor was the slim one or the little one. But it gives you some information about your ancestor that you might not have. Um, this is James Davis, and it has Satilla in parentheses. That tells you where he lived. The Satilla River uh, runs through this, this county. And so that tells you, and, and there's a, you know there's another James Davis in that county, or they would not have designated this one as the Satilla River. And this one, Benjamin Adams, it says of Arthur. So they're telling you who Benjamin Adams' father is and that's the last one it's the last one on the road there um, so there's you know there's two bench probably two Benjamin Adams is in this how in this county and that this one is his father's name is Arthur okay and this one is the 1860 census of Campbell County Virginia And, uh, and they're not supposed to give relationships on these early censuses, but sometimes they did put uh, profession or occupation or trade uh, in there, and they would, um, they, this one tells you that um, the, the, car, the wife is listed, that's listed as her occupation. Well, often they didn't do that. This tells you that this woman is his wife, but sometimes they would say that the wife was, uh, kept house or whatever, but this tells you that she is the wife and he, de he decided that that was, um, that was her job, that was her occupation, being a wife. Okay, 1870 census, Georgetown. Um, this one, oh, this is where they're supposed to give you the state of their birth, and this particular census they give you the county, uh, Henry County, um, and other places that they were actually born. Okay, 1900 to 1940 censuses, the originals were destroyed after being microfilmed, which is, can be good or bad, but uh, they just, they were so, so many, it's just huge by the time our population had gotten so big that, um, that they just they had microfilmed them and then they destroyed them the night i believe it's the 1910 census that is very very difficult to read but we don't have the original anymore all we have is the microfilm so that was you know i wish they had waited a little bit longer to have a look at the microfilm before they decided they would uh, get rid of them but they did not but unlike the 1910 census i believe is the one that is the most difficult to read and um Real quickly, I need to get this done. Okay, there are several ways to find your ancestors on the census. There are computer indexes like Ancestry. There are printed indexes. There are books that have been done if you're looking for up to about nine, uh, the 1880 census. There are books that have been done uh, that you can find in local libraries. And there's Soundex. Now, sound, I just want to mention Soundex because it, it's, it can be helpful in finding people that you uh, can't find on the census because their name is mistranscribed. Uh, it's based on how a name sounds, not how it's spelled. So, this is the case of Andrew Ginn. We were looking for Andrew Ginn, and we looked everywhere. We could not find him, and we knew he had a son named Clyde, born seven, 1878. We could not find the Ginns in this county. We knew what county they were in. And this is a picture of a Soundex card. 
uh, that was filled out, and it is, um, you know, it's by the head of household, and it lists all the people in the household. This we found Andrew was in, was he was he was on the census as Ann, A N N, kind of like a boy named Sue. I mean, I don't know, but he was in, he was on the census as Ann, and they spelled Gin G U I N N, which we would never have found. We might have figured it out, but anyway. But the sound and Soundex cards, they're on Family Search now. If you're having trouble finding somebody, check and see if they have a Soundex card for the 1880 census there. And this is where we found him. This is a picture of him, his uh, census record that we finally located because we looked for Ann instead of Andrew. So, and if every index fails, if all else fails. Browse the county. I know it's big counties, but if you have an unusual first name or last name, browse that county to see if you find your ancestor. And the caveats. Uh, you, can, you can search by county. You can put in just the county and their first name or their last name in the certain county. On the, you know, on, in Ancestry, you, when you search in Ancestry, you can put in Martin and Coweta County, and it'll just show you all the Martins in Coweta County. Um, I need to finish this up, but this, this particular, the case of two Marthas, and I think this is in your handout. Um, you can put look at that, but you need to be careful when you see, um, you wanna be sure and check the marriage records, because in this one, uh, Martha was 20, 30, 24, then the next 10 years she was 34, and in the next 10 years, she only got it to 40. Now, you don't know if she maybe she forgot how old she was or someone else gave the information. You know, you don't, you don't know who gave the information. So you say, hmm, well, that's the same Martha. But um, it is not, that's not the, tr the case. It, you, if you go and look at the marriage records, you'll find that um, this man married another woman named Martha in the late 1860s. So you need, if, the, if something looks peculiar, you wanna go check those uh, marriage records to make sure, uh, because you could assume that it was the same, you know, the same wife. She had just messed up her age a little bit. Um, and this is, let's see, I've already done that one. Okay, enumerator appreciation, that is, um, that is in your handout. And this fellow had so much trouble doing the census that um, he decided that he was going to write that he was going to write a note to the peop to the uh, census people and tell them exactly what he thought. And that is in your handout. And uh, he gets, says on there, if I'd known it was going to take me this long. I would have charged them, what, what is it, I'm not sure how much it says, but it was like one cent per person or four cents a head. So anyway, and he, he figured out how, he said, I, 1,200 miles, and he actually wrote this on the census, and it is, it is there for everyone to see, uh, all, the, all of the detail that he went into about how much trouble it is to be a census taker, and he, I think probably he would never do it again. So I think uh, our time is up. I appreciate your kind attention, and I did not. I don't know. I tell you what, go get that census um, break-off sheet. I called it a break-off sheet, and it'll have all of the columns on there. Every, every census was different about what they'd asked. So you'll want, yeah, 1930 very similar to 1930 but yeah go and see because it'll, it'll give you clues to go look for things and tells you how much how long they've been to school all those kinds of things so I think yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Why 72 years? I don't know. They just declared that. She knows. All right. You want to give her the...
old. Okay. Right. And right. 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 And the question was, why was it set? Why under the census is? Um, released 72 years after they are taken. And the answer was that when they first were, National Archives was created, that they were first transferred to the National Archives and they were 72 years old when they got there. So they, that just came tradition and eventually it was codified. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.